Hi, this is HJ. Welcome to the second video of the Unity UI Toolkit Beginner's Guide. In this video, I'll show you how to make an animated bottom sheet in the UI Toolkit. When the button is clicked, the sheet comes up from the bottom of the screen. It goes down when the close button is clicked. For the interaction and animation, we'll do a bit of scripting or coding. The bottom sheet is drawn over the existing UI, not affecting the layout below. For this, position properties will be covered as well. We need a parent of the bottom sheet group, a half transparent scrim and the bottom sheet itself. Add a visual element for the parent. To cover the screen entirely, set 100% for width and height. Although I set it to 100%, it doesn't cover the entire screen. To make matters worse, it pushed the existing UI breaking the layout. I'll explain what's happening and how to solve the problem with examples. This canvas is 1000 by 1500 pixels. Three visual elements are placed by the column direction in flex. They are all 500 pixels high. Here I add another visual element which is 500 in height and width. I want this element to be placed like a modal window. However, it pushes the existing elements out of their places instead of being on top of them. As we saw in the last video, it's due to the flex layout. If I try to adjust bottom property in the position, it can be moved. However, the space it occupied remains empty. What I need is something like the layout element component in UGUI. With the ignore layout on, I could exclude a specific game object from a layout group. There is a way to achieve this effect in the UI toolkit. Unset the value. In the position dropdown, select Absolute. Immediately, the previous layout is restored. The new elements move to the top left corner as if it is excluded from the group. Now I can place the element anywhere I'd like. The names Relative and Absolute are sometimes confusing. Simply put, when you want an element not to be influenced by the flex, choose Absolute. Otherwise, leave it relative. Let's take this opportunity to take a deeper look at flex. When the new element was added, all the four elements were fitted into the canvas, which is 1500 pixels in height. Even though each was set 500 in height, they were automatically shrunk to be fitted into the available space. This is because they have a value other than zero in the shrink property. When the available space is not enough for its children, the child with non-zero shrink value begins to reduce its size. If I change the shrink value of the red rectangle to zero, it restores its height set in the size. Other children shrink more instead. If the available space is reduced more, only the children with non-zero shrink values are affected. It shrinks by the percentage of the total shrink value of all the children. Put it simply, the larger the value is, the more it shrinks. The grow next to it is the opposite. It sets the degree to increase its size to fill the free space. Put any non-zero value to it. It increases its size to fill the available space. Recently, there are so many different resolutions and aspect ratios in mobile devices. The meaning of standard resolution has faded greatly. In this situation, UI Toolkit's layout function enables much more flexibility. Let's go back to where we left. Select Absolute in the Position drop-down menu. This is the parent of the bottom sheet group. Make it cover the entire screen. If you set the glow to 1, it wouldn't work. The glow and shrink only work when the element uses relative positioning. Put 100% both for width and height. Give it a name. It's time to make a scrim which darkens the UI below. Add a visual element as a child and name it properly. This child uses relative positioning, so set the glow to 1 to fill the screen. Add another visual element. It's the bottom sheet itself. Make sure that you add it as a sibling of the scrim. Since the bottom sheet moves up and down without changing the layout, select Absolute Positioning. It covers the bottom half of the screen, set height to 50% and width 100%.
In position, set bottom to zero. It's aligned to the bottom of the screen. Set its color to white and round the two upper vertices. Go to borders radius and put 40 pixels in top left and top right. Next, I'll populate the bottom sheet according to the design. Add two labels and one image as children. The button will be added later. Load a prepared texture for the image and put 400 and 500 pixels for width and height. It's time to change the labels. To keep our styles consistent, let's use the style classes we learned in the previous video. Select the title label, give it a proper name and extract inline style. Do the same for the paragraph. For reference, Unity recommends using a style sheet rather than inline styles. Drag each selector to its corresponding label. In the hierarchy, change the order and then center align them in the align items. Use padding to give extra space around the labels and paste prepared strings. Earlier I said I would add the button later. It's the button to close the bottom sheet. This button will be placed at the top right of the sheet. Change to absolute positioning so that it's not affected by the existing layout. I need some space from the right side. I'll use the right property in position. Size it 45 pixels in width and height. This button has no text, so empty the text field. In addition, zero the values in properties such as border and color. Load a texture and adjust the tint so that it can be seen on a white background. All layout work is complete. We now move on to scripting for simple interactions and animations. Several unnamed elements are still there. Since we'll search some elements by their names in scripting, we should give them recognizable names. Name two buttons which will open and close the bottom sheet. The image in the bottom sheet will be animated in the next video. So give the image a name as well. Before creating full-fledged animations, let's start by making the bottom group appear and disappear with buttons. Select the parent of the bottom sheet group and go to the inspector. In the display, there is a familiar name, the opacity. Lower the opacity to zero. The entire group fades away and eventually disappears. Opacity is inherited by children in the UI toolkit. It is the same as that a canvas group is attached and its alpha value is lowered to zero in UGUI. Then, let's test whether we can make the bottom sheet disappear with the opacity property. With the preview on, hover the mouse pointer over the button. The hover and active state are not initiated. It's invisible, but it's actually there, blocking my mouse input. For testing, I temporarily delete the group. You can see the button is just working fine. We need a state in which elements are invisible and mouse input are not blocked, just like game objects deactivated in UGUI. There are a couple of ways to achieve this state. One of the simplest ways is to use the display property right below. Click the button with an eye icon. The bottom sheet are invisible and the mouse input works fine. The display property not only makes an element invisible, but also removing it from its hierarchy. It means the related layout is affected. When the display is set to none, the layout actually changes. Unset all the properties changed for testing. Then let's start scripting. I'm going to show and hide the bottom sheet group with each button. Instead of talking about scripting in depth, I will briefly explain only what's necessary here. Create a C-sharp script and name it UI controller. Attach the script to the game object with the UI document component. Open the script. In order to script UI toolkit, we need to use a new namespace, Unity Engine UI Elements. My simple interaction consists of three visual elements, open button, close button, and bottom sheet group. Declare three variables for them. The next thing to do is to search the two buttons and one visual element and store them in the corresponding variables. This job should be done before a user interacts with our UI. The start method, which is called when our scene starts, seems a good candidate. When searching an element in the UI from scripts, you can use a special method called uQuery. 
To begin our searching, we need a starting point. We don't have any reference to elements in the UI at the moment. In this case, grab the topmost visual element in the hierarchy. The hierarchy we saw in the UI builder is called a visual tree by another name. And the topmost element that is not shown in the hierarchy is called a root visual element. Declare a variable inside the start method. With get component, I can have access to the UI document component which is connected to my UXML file. Now I can get a reference to my UI's root element readily with root visual element property. Finally, it's time to use uQuery. It's pretty easy. Just the type and name of the visual element to search are all needed. Let's find the bottom sheet group. Do the same for the two buttons. I'll test the code so far. You can remember that I hit the bottom sheet group with the display property in the UI builder. I'll do the same, but this time with code. Append style and display behind the variable. And then set it to display style none. It'll hide the element that the variable refer to. The autocomplete feature of IDE makes scripting much easier. Play the scene. You can see the bottom sheet group has been hidden. It is successfully confirmed that we can have access to a visual element from our script and set its property. Next, I'll script a basic interaction with a button. In UGUI, you can add a callback method in the editor. Unfortunately, scripting is the only way in the UI toolkit at the moment. Go back to the start method and let the open button trigger another method when it's clicked. Behind the variable, write register callback. It's the method that lets the button do something when a certain UI event occurred. It requires two pieces of information. One is when to do or event type in the angle brackets. The other is what to do or method name in the parentheses. The event type is click event. For reference, Unity offers many other UI events other than click event. For the method, I name it on open button click. Outside the start method, write the method. The code that hid the bottom sheet must be reusable. Copy and paste the code. It will be called when the open button clicked. Therefore, change the none to flex. Do the same for the close button. Of course, the display is set to none for the close button. Let's see if it works well at runtime. Everything works as expected. However, it looks too abrupt and rigid because there is no transition animation. I'll polish it with the transition animation learned in the previous video. When the button is clicked, the bottom sheet will move up smoothly and the scrim will fade in. Move the bottom sheet out of the screen. It'll be the starting position. You can set the position's bottom property. It works. But there is a better and recommended way. In the transform, change the translate Y value. It works as well. What's the difference? Unity recommends using the position properties when dealing with static elements. On the contrary, the transform is for dynamic elements because the transform properties don't cause layout recalculation. This dual structure seems to come from HTML. For this reason, I'll use the transform. Set the translate Y to 100%. It's moved as down as its height. It means that its tops always align to the bottom of the screen regardless of resolutions. The bottom sheet is basically animated with the transition animation we saw in the last video. When we change the button state, the interpolations between pseudo classes take place automatically. However, the interpolations between style classes are controlled by code. First, make two classes, bottom sheet up and bottom sheet down. Set its transition animation in the default state, that is the down state. Set the duration to one second and easing to ease out bounce. I'm intentionally making the animation slightly exaggerated. Extract the inline style to a new style class. Make another state in which the bottom sheet is up. Extract this state into a new class. In the style class list, the two new selectors we've just made are listed. Delete the bottom sheet up class. In the viewport, you can see the transition animation without playing the scene. In the style sheets pane, you can see the two selectors have been newly registered. Drag the down selector to the bottom sheet in the hierarchy. You can also preview the animation this way. As we've seen, adding or removing class from a visual elements class list causes the transition to take place. I'll just do the exact same thing with code. 
The scrims fade in and out can be animated too. It's invisible in the default state. Set the opacity to zero and duration to one second. Extract this inline style to a new class. Let's make its fade in class. Just change the opacity to 100, extract it to a new class. Test its transition in the UI builder like before. Make sure that only the default style remains in the style list and go back to the script. Declare two new variables, one for the bottom sheet, the other for the scrim. Using new query, search both visual elements with their names and store them in the variables. Go to the method which is called when the open button is clicked. Behind the bottom sheet variable, write a method called add to class list and the class name. I copy the class name from the USS file. When I drag the class selector to a visual element in the hierarchy, the transition animation played. This method does the same thing. As its name suggests, it adds a style to the style list of the visual element. Write the code for the scrim the same way. Let's play the scene. The animation seems to play well at runtime as well. However, if you close the sheet and open again, the animation won't play. I will deal with this issue in a moment. It would be better if the scrim animation were a bit faster. I won't go to the UI builder. Instead, the animation is tweaked in the code. Go to the USS file. Find the style class for the scrim. At the bottom, there is transition duration. Change the value to 0 0.25. The animation became much simpler. It's time to deal with the issue I left behind. When we reopened the bottom sheet, the transition animation doesn't play anymore. Take a close look at the related code. There are two lines of code adding styles to class lists. When the button was clicked first time, the styles were added to the style lists and the transition animations played as a result. After closing the bottom sheet, we clicked again. When the styles were added again, the two visual elements already had the styles in the list. It means there were no difference between states. No difference means no transition. Go to the method for closing. The added classes need to be removed here. Behind the bottom sheet variable, write remove from class list. As its name suggests, the method dose the exact opposite of the add to class list method. In the parentheses, write the class to remove, do the same for the scrim. Now the animation works well even after the first closing. One downside is no transition animation for the closing. The reason lies with the code. Before the transition starts, the code hides the whole group. Along with the solution to this problem, the next video will cover how to start animation when the scene starts and how to loop animation. Thank you for watching.